I'm Bart Frazier. I'm with the Future Freedom Foundation. We are the people who have been bringing you uncompromising libertarianism since 1989. I'm just going to give you a quick intro. We're just a, a nonprofit educational foundation trying to uh, bring you the, the, uh, the meanings of individual liberty and uh, free markets uh, to the wide populace uh, to bring us a free society. Uh, we've been publishing a journal, uh, Future of Freedom, formerly known as Freedom Daily, since our inception. Uh, we have a huge presence on the internet uh, with a website with over 100 videos and 4,000 articles. Um, we were also at the Students for Liberty conference this weekend. Was anybody here or there? Good time. It was wonderful. Just a, an a astounding number of libertarians in one place. It was inspirational to be to. And uh, it was also enabled us to uh, bring one of our heroes here. Bob Higgs was one of our speakers uh, at the uh, conference this weekend. Uh, he was a warrior because his flight got canceled out of Louisiana on Friday, and he jumped on a plane on Saturday for us. He was supposed to speak at noon. We switched him to five. Another one of our speakers got canceled. We switched them to five. Bob basically jumped off the airplane into the podium and uh, was fantastic for us, as you might imagine. Um, so we are very fortunate to have him this evening. Uh, also for the semester, we have March 3rd, uh, David Bose will be here. And then via Skype on April 28th, uh, we're going to have Walter Block. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Econ Society, please join it if you're a student here. It's a fantastic organization. And uh, here is the president of the organization, uh, David, uh, who will tell you about it and also introduce Bob. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, rather. Um, I'm David Roth, president of the Economic Society at Mason. Uh, the Econ Society is a student organization that's devoted to the personal, professional, and academic development of all students interested in the study of economics. We do that by hosting lecture sessions like this one, uh, discussion sessions with our members, and other uh, opportunities for students to interact with professional economists. Uh, if you'd like to get more information about the Economic Society, please talk to me after the event, or visit our website, economics-society.org. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Robert Higgs. Robert Higgs is a senior fellow in the political economy for the Independent Institute and editor-at-large of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. He received his PhD in economics from uh, John Hopkins University and has taught the University of Washington, Lafayette College, Seattle University, and the University of Economics, Prague. He has been a visiting scholar at Oxford University and Stanford University and is a fellow at the Hoover Institute and National Science Foundation. Higgs has authored several books, including uh, Crisis and Leviathan, Critical Episodes in the Growth of American Government, Against Leviathan, Government Power and a Free Society, and most recently, Delusions of Power, New Explorations of State, War, and Economy. Please welcome Robert Higgs. Thank you, David. And uh, thank all of you for coming out here when you had had good excuses not to. It's been an extraordinary winter, as I don't have to tell anybody, I'm sure. And uh, I've never seen so much snow lying around on the ground here in Fairfax before. So uh, congratulations on getting the streets and sidewalks cleared. Uh, I guess, you know, if we didn't have government, no one would ever clear the streets or sidewalks. The, uh, the topic for my presentation tonight is the logic of crisis and Leviathan and why it still holds. And uh, this is a, a presentation that deals with the growth of government. I started uh, doing research and writing on this subject more than 30 years ago. At that time, it was little more than a cottage industry for economists and a, a few other social scientists, but it, uh, uh, it, it got to be a big deal uh, by the uh, end of the 1980s, and, and so I was uh, 
not exactly in there at the beginning, but I was almost in there at the beginning. Uh, I, I ended up uh, working about five years mainly on a project about the growth of government in the United States be, between the late 19th century and what was then the present day, which was the 1980s. And uh, that book was published in 1987, and it's called Crisis and Leviathan. And uh, it's been uh, reissued recently, a couple of years ago, in uh, a so-called 25th anniversary edition. And uh, the reason for doing that is not that I've rewritten it. I haven't, uh, except there's a new preface here. But uh, what I have done is, uh, is to keep it in print. Oxford University Press got tired of it after 20-some years, and uh, some friends of mine thought it would be a good idea to keep it in print. But uh, this is a book where I develop most aspects of my thinking on the growth of government, but I didn't stop doing my work uh, at that time. I continued to work on uh, what you might think of as sequels to uh, a Crisis and Leviathan in various ways. And, uh, and most of the books I've published since then are of that character. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, I want to mention two in particular. Uh, three, actually. One I won't discuss much tonight. Uh, it's called Depression, War, and Cold War. And that's a, a sequel uh, that is focused on that particular area there, having to do with foreign and military affairs and, and how they've been conducted and how they've uh, contributed to the growth and power of the state uh, since the Great Depression. But uh, the two I want to mention, uh, first is one called uh, Neither Liberty Nor Safety, published in 2007. And the, uh, the subtitle of this book tells you more about its content. Uh, the subtitle is Fear, Ideology, and the Growth of Government. And it's a collection uh, of papers written shortly before the 2007 publication date of this book. So uh, this is more recent thinking uh, in various regards. It's uh, my attempt to push forward a little bit what I uh, had learned when the first book was published and, uh, and, and to move a little bit into related areas. The second book I'll mention is called uh, Delusions of Power, subtitled New Explorations of the State, War, and Economy. And once again, uh, that's recently written papers between about 2007 and 2012, once again, pushing out areas related to the growth of government for the most part. Not entirely. There are some other things uh, dealt with as well. But uh, what I want you to do is uh, take note of these three books. I want you to go out and order at least a dozen, <laughs> and uh, we'll be We'll all be happy. You can you can give uh, you can give all your cranky relatives a copy next Christmas or on their birthday, and uh, really get on their good side. <laughs> but uh, let's see what I, I have to say about the uh, what I call the logic of crisis in Leviathan, and and then finally arrive at some consideration of uh, why I think that logic is still as strong as ever, why we can expect the way that this relationship played out during the 20th century to be the way it'll play out in the future, at least as far as I can see, uh, it, unless some very important changes take place in the future. And I'll try to s stipulate what kinds of changes those would have to be. Uh, when I started studying the growth of government, many of the people who were involved in, in that uh, endeavor were thinking of the growth of government as a kind of long-run trend phenomenon. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of study to go back in history and see that, uh, say, in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, uh, the government, regardless of how you measure it, was much smaller in the United States and in every other uh, advanced uh, economy in the world. Uh, particularly the countries of Western Europe, 
and uh, their offshoots such as uh, Canada and the United States, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, by the time you got up to the 1980s, all of these places, uh, e even the one where government had grown the least, which was Switzerland, uh, all of them had much bigger governments than they had had uh, 80 or 90 years before, or any previous time for that matter, although there might have been a few little aberrations back in history, say, associated with the Napoleonic Wars, uh, where very briefly government got very big, but then it uh, fell back to a very small uh, level afterwards. Uh, and in the long haul of the 19th century, there's very little growth of government uh, anywhere, anywhere in the world. So th this uh, seemed to be, for a time, uh, a world in which classical liberals who favored a, a minimal state uh, were getting what they wanted, not entirely, but in large part. At least they were restraining the state from becoming uh, much more obnoxious and intrusive and destructive than it was. Uh, and, in, and in some places, people even began to claim that, that there was a condition of laissez-faire uh, in existence. That, that was too big a claim. No, no country ever had real laissez-faire. They always had some kinds of government activities that violated the tenets of laissez-faire principles. But nonetheless, uh, Britain in the mid-19th century, uh, the United States in the 1840s and 50s, and then later on in the 1880s and uh, into the 1890s, came pretty close, about as close as any uh, uh, countries in recent centuries have come to, to being uh, laissez-faire systems. Now, if you look back at how government got bigger over, say, the course of the 20th century, or most of it, uh, as I said, most economists were not worrying about the precise pattern that the growth uh, followed, the path of the growth of government. They were just concerned with the fact that it had become much bigger than it was previously. Some people did break it down into sub-periods and look at them separately. And a lot of people actually did curious things with their data. For example, a number of economists studying the growth of government excluded wartime years from the sample on the grounds that that was extraordinary, that didn't count. Uh, those are aberrations somehow from what they were trying to discover. And so they didn't want to to mar the purity of their empirical sample by allowing these aberrations to remain in the data set. Uh, when, I, when I began to study this, I'd already been an economic historian for 12 years or more, and, and I'd been teaching about the U.S. economy and the whole, whole span of its history, and, and it seemed very strange to me that people were stylizing the facts about the growth of government the way they were, that they were just content with explaining the long-run trend of government growth, or they were content with explaining some substantial sub-periods of 20 or 30 years uh, and trying to account for kind of what you'd think of as gross movement rather than, than the details of movement, say the year-to-year -year movements or changes. Uh, and I also, as I thought about it, became convinced very quickly that, that it was a big mistake to throw out any data, but particularly to throw out wartime periods. Because I learned that very often events that occurred during these wartime periods had consequences for what was done later in peacetime. So it seemed that one was throwing away very valuable and informative information by uh, editing the data in that way. So I set out uh, in a way to explain not just the fact that government had gotten much bigger over the long haul, but to explain the precise path by which it had become much bigger over that century or so I identified earlier. So I, I ultimately uh, uh, analyzed a number of 
proposed explanations. And uh, these are all still in play today. None of them has gone away. And uh, in the first chapter of my book, Crisis and Leviathan, I, I walk through them, giving uh, two or three pages to each of them to explain uh, basically what they uh, affirm and what I see as some of the problems with them. Uh, I did that because at the time, these were, uh, in a sense, the prevailing explanations that economists were offering. Uh, and I added one or two of my own uh, that I'd stumbled upon elsewhere, but, but economists were basically taking uh, modern welfare economics, the, the kind of analysis developed in the 1930s and 40s, to talk about market imperfections. And the nature of their explanation for the growth of government uh, was a, a kind of corollary. They derived from what they had been teaching about market imperfections. Uh, that, that general drift of thinking says that relative to an ideal blackboard specification of a market, uh, we can think about ways in which uh, real uh, world uh, occurrences and events and structures might deviate from those ideals in such a way that the ideal efficiency of a blackboard fully competitive uh, model economy would not be realized. And the burden of the new welfare economists was to say, well, if that's the case, then what can be done, and implicitly they usually meant what should be done, is that governments should undertake to correct for these uh, market failures. Now remember, it's not a failure in any sense other than a failure to meet fully the specifications of an idealized model. <laughs> uh, that's the only sense in which it can be called a failure. And that's, if you think about it, that's a rather odd sense, isn't it? It's like saying that you're a moral failure because Aristotle stipulated all the things that a virtuous person would do, and you don't do them all. So you're a mor moral flopperoo, as my old friend Murray Rothbard would have said. <laughs> uh, but that's kind of preposterous if you think about it, because we're all sinners, you know. We don't have any fully moral people here in the crowd. <laughs> I don't even know you, and I say that. <laughs> But I'm confident, okay, and in the same way, we don't have any fully efficient, perfectly competitive economies in the real world either. So uh, it's an odd thing to call something a failure when it's actually an inevitability. <laughs> it, you cannot help but fail by that kind of standard. But nonetheless, that was a very popular way for economists to talk about uh, the observations they made of the real world and to justify recommendations for government interference of various kinds. Now, if in fact that kind of understanding and recommendation had been at work in the world, then it might have been the case that the things that government began, began to do that it hadn't done before could be seen in that light. If the government had, say, never tried to control pollution of the air and water in the past, and uh, then government began in some way to attempt to do so, the economists might say, well, it did that because pollution occurs, uh, it signifies, uh, manifests a market failure, it's a it's an instance of the, the parties to a transaction not taking into account the costs and benefits of everyone affected by the transaction. Some of these people that weren't involved in uh, the factory's decision about how much to produce or how to produce it to still get smoke spilled over onto their property in a way that, that damages it. So that's a negative external effect, and uh, government can fix that uh, in a way. It can at least uh, uh, take actions such as taxing the factory's output uh, that lead the factory, at least in theory, to reduce its rate of output. And if it reduces its rate of output, it reduces the amount of 
external harm it causes. So you could tell a story like that about negative externalities, about public goods, about monopoly power, about imperfect information of the transactors in the real world economy. And you could walk through the whole of, of, uh, of modern welfare economics and find yourself what seemed like fitting explanations of why government had undertaken to do more things over the course of time. What I found, however, as a historian is that when I went out and looked at all the things government had started doing more of or started doing for the first time, very few of them actually fell into those categories. And the ones that did, uh, did so in a way that didn't seem to line up with the actual his historical stories of how the programs were put into effect. So uh, basically, I ultimately concluded that th those kinds of explanations were just excuses. They were rationales for the growth of government, almost ex post rationales that economists had come along and laid on top of the historical developments that made them look rational, made them look like efficiency enhancements, made them look like good, good deeds done by government for the general public, uh, but uh, the details of the historical developments didn't line up like that very often. Uh, I won't say never, uh, because in some cases they came fairly close, but in general they don't in my judgment, and uh, I haven't learned anything since my early research to cha change my mind in that regard. But you're still left with some other uh, ideas about what could have caused the growth of government, and so I, I took uh, those into account as well. One of the things I insisted on in the first book, and I insist on today, and I'm emphasizing this because a lot of people who, who have taken note of my work have not taken note of this aspect of it, is that I never, ever proposed a monocausal explanation of the growth of government. And in fact, I, I want to explicitly deny that I think any one thing caused the growth of government. I think a variety of things caused the growth of government, and uh, they can be described, categorized, studied, measured to some extent, uh, independently of one another. Not to say they all acted independently in practice, but, but they, they can be seen as separate causes of the growth of government. Uh, my work has been um, seen, however, uh, in the light of another explanation, which is the crisis hypothesis. I didn't invent this. Many people had noticed that uh, during national emergencies, especially during wars, governments tended to, to, to undertake extraordinary actions. They did things they hadn't been doing before, and they did things they had been doing before on a much greater scale. So wartime looked like, you know, yeah, that's a burst of the growth of government. And some people had realized that, that indeed some of those wartime uh, surges of the size, scope, and power of government remained after the emergency passed. Uh, a long time ago, uh, w uh, several years before I started studying this, well, 20 years, I guess, before I started studying, a couple of English economists, Peacock and Wiseman, uh, wrote a book uh, on, the, on the growth of uh, uh, spending and taxing in Great Britain. And they advanced uh, a ratchet uh, hypothesis uh, to the extent that they said uh, during World War I and again during World War II, the British government uh, s uh, suddenly began to tax and spend at much higher levels than it had before the war. And in each case, after the war, uh, taxing and spending declined when the war was over, but not back to the level of the pre-war uh, period. And they lined up a lot of data uh, that confirmed that uh, observation, and, and, and indeed, I think they were certainly correct. Uh, and uh, people like uh, Jim Buchanan, who taught here for a long time at George Mason, uh, were aware of that hypothesis and talked about it occasionally. So it was out there in the field when I came along. Uh, I have my own kind of ratchet hypothesis, however, 
And uh, it's different from Peacock and Wiseman. It's different from Solomon Fabricant, who had written an even earlier book about America's growth of government for the National Bureau of Economic Research, I think published around 1952, as I recall. But, but the earlier literature on this subject focused on fiscal changes, changes in government spending, uh, changes in government taxation, overwhelmingly. That was the subject. And the people who were doing this were public finance specialists. Okay? Uh, and, and so they, they, they studied it in the way a public finance guy would, including by referring to the uh, theory of market failure. Now, what I did was, uh, first of all, characterize what I mean by a, a, a national emergency or crisis episode of the growth of government. Uh, if, if we look over the long haul of government, however we measure it, uh, we see it uh, not just kind of going along like that where you could draw a smooth trend line through it and never be far from the trend value. What we see is it, it goes along uh, it's already growing by the late 19th century, although uh, not very much at the federal level. In the late 19th century and early 20th, most of the growth of government was at the local level of government. Not the state, not the federal, but the local. And a lot of it involved building infrastructure. Urbanization was going on all over this country. Uh, new cities were being formed. Old cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and uh, the city governments were building streets, lighting, uh, sanitation systems, water supply systems. Th these were big capital investments, uh, and so they required the city governments to spend extraordinary amounts of money compared to anything that had happened in the past. Uh, but uh, government was growing some uh, before World War I. Then World War I came along, and it shot up hugely. Uh, at the federal level. Uh, after the war, it came back, and then again during the early 1930s, it shot up again uh, during the Hoover administration, uh, and then again during the early years of the Roosevelt administration as well. Uh, and then it, 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 it came to World War II very quickly, shot up even more than ever, in fact, more than ever in our history, uh, and then there was a retrenchment after World War II, and then it continued upward again. So, so the long haul has, it's not a smooth trend line, but it, uh, a sort of smooth trend line with, with spikes on it every once in a while. They seem like short-term spikes, and it's because they were, they were fairly short-term that, that these economists I mentioned earlier had thought, they're just aberrations, let's throw them out. Uh, they're, they're messing up our analysis of the trend movement, which is, Economists always somehow think the trend movement is the true deal going on here, you know. Uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, outliers. But in fact, outliers are often the most informative thing you can study when you're doing empirical analysis. You can find out why those outliers do what they do. Then you've probably got a really good handle on understanding the variable you're analyzing. So. I, I developed a stylized kind of picture. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a marker here, but I don't need one. I'll use my arm. <laughs> That's the trend. <laughs> and uh, what, what I proposed was a kind of idealization of my own. I proposed that what's being measured here on the vertical scale is the true size of government. And I called it that because uh, I want to take into account not just things like spending or taxing, debt, uh, but a variety of other ways in which government can control resource allocation and, uh, and other aspects of social behavior. So we've got here measuring the logarithm of the true size of government. Okay? So the slope of this line is going to give us the rate of growth. Of government. We come to a crisis like one of the World Wars or the Great Depression, and what happens is that the, uh, the government surges, its true size jumps up very quickly uh, in a year, two years, uh, to a much greater level. 
then during the course of the crisis, it stays at that high level. When the crisis ends, the government retrenches. But it started back here. It went up. It retrenched. But it came back only this far. And then it starts sort of growing at its old trend rate again. But look, its new trend line is not here. It's up here. So every time you go through one of these uh, crisis episodes, you shift the trend line of growth upward to a higher level. You take, take a jump, and you, and you displace the trajectory. And uh, that's just a kind of formal way to sketch the process. And what I've tried to do is fill in the substance of why it looks like that. What happens to make it follow that pattern? And it followed it not only during those three episodes I mentioned, but it later had similar experience during the Johnson-Nixon years. Uh, there's no kind of accepted name for that. Uh, I just think of it as the time when all hell broke loose because uh, I was uh, myself uh, a grown man when that happened, so I lived through it. And believe me, all hell was breaking loose in a lot of different ways. Uh, but... You know, the excitement really started around 1964, and then it stayed at a high level up until about the time Nixon was run out of office. And uh, so it's about a decade there. Uh, and then, of course, we have a relatively placid period after that until 2001 when we have another one of these surges. Now, of course, I hadn't written about it in my book, because my book was first book was published in '87, but I will just give you one little clue, and and this actually was uh, the page of my book that probably attracted the most criticism from reviewers. Uh, you think a review would not seize on the material in half a page of a book that's 360 pages long, but that's what happened. And uh, here's what I said. I, I said, uh, we know something, at least abstractly, about the future. Huh? No economist is a prophet, of course. <laughs> we, we don't know what's going to happen next week, much less what's going to happen next year. But we know something abstractly about the future. We know that other great crises will come. Uh, whether they will be occasioned by foreign wars, economic collapse, or rampant terrorism, no one can predict with assurance. Yet, in one form or another, great crises will surely come again, as they have from time to time throughout all human history. When they do, governments almost certainly will gain new powers over economic and social affairs. Okay, that is like four or five lines got me in trouble with the reviewers. They said, we, oh, we've had a Reagan revolution. All those pro-government people are on the run. They're as good as whooped. Uh, it's all over but the shouting. Uh, to which I said, well, I don't think so because I don't see any reason why the process I identified as having uh, accounted for the growth of the government for a hundred years previously, is at an end. It seems to me that every condition that existed to make those ratchet effects uh, look the way they did in the past still existed. Not in its precise details, of course, uh, but in its general significance. And I'll come back to that a little later today. So this kind of movement, incomplete retrenchment after rapid surge, uh, I call the ratchet effect. And that's been identified as my explanation for the growth of government. But to repeat, uh, I, I don't dismiss all the others uh, at all. This is just an important part of explaining the precise path followed by the growth of government. Now, one of the things that uh, was brought to my attention early in my research uh, when I began to give uh, talks about this uh, research around the country at different universities, uh, and people would say, well, you know, there have been crises throughout history. Why is it that in 1885 the government was so small? Why hadn't it gone through a ratcheting process of growth already? There were crises aplenty 
for the previous four or 5,000 years. Uh, some of them terrible crises indeed, you know, worse than anything experienced in the past 150 years. I mean, the Black Death killed a third of the people, people in Europe. Talk about a crisis. Uh, but that didn't result in the ratchet effect of government. And you could I identify any number of episodes in history that, that didn't play out this way. Uh, and I thought about that, <clears throat> and it caused me to push my analysis back some, because it, uh, it, it seemed to me from my study that, that the reason the ratchet effect had worked the way it did in the 20th century had to do with a very important, indeed critical change in the preconditions for the working of the ratchet. Uh, that is to say, uh, if you look at why the ratchet works the way it does, it doesn't work that way under all social and economic conditions, only under certain kinds. And the, the main thing that's important is an ideological precondition. As it turned out, the dominant ideology of this country, uh, as well as many other countries, was undergoing change in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And, and it, it came to a to a, uh, a climax in what we call the progressive era, which is roughly from around 1900 up to World War I, normally dated. And that was a period in which the so-called progressives uh, were undertaking all kinds of new government programs, changing the way government was operated, enacting new constraints on government in some cases, uh, uh, giving government new powers for the most part. Uh, this was a movement that occurred at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, the people involved in it were extremely diverse. So uh, it's very hard to summarize what progressivism involved, but there was one thing that it almost invariably involved regardless of its specific character, and that was the progressives sought to use expanded power of government to achieve some end that they thought needed to be achieved. So that was the kind of common denominator of the ideological change that took place in this country. Now, now previously, it wasn't that nobody ever wanted to use government in that way. Certainly, there have always been some people that wanted to use government to feather their own nests or to, you know, help their friends and hurt their enemies. That's, that's as old as as government as we know it. But nonetheless, government was restrained by the dominant ideology, uh, the dominant ideology, the one that most people sort of use to view the world and to, to, to come to conclusions about uh, what was right and wrong about it and what should be done about it uh, and uh, who was the friend and who was the enemy of mankind. All those things are questions answered by one's ideology. And in the late 18th and um, practically the whole of the 19th century, the dominant ideology in the United States was one not of laissez-faire, but of something verging on it. That is to say, most people thought that government ought to have a very limited role. They weren't anarchists. Their anarchists were practically unknown in this country or any other, so far as I'm aware, but, uh, but a great many people did believe that government shouldn't get involved uh, in a whole host of things that ultimately government did get involved in. Right? They would say, it's not the proper business of government to do X, to do Y. Uh, now, in fact, they became more like that after the 1840s, because before that, there had been a lot of government involvement in economic activity at the state level and the local level for that matter, uh, holdovers from the old kind of regulations that, that the English had brought down from the Middle Ages, you know, when they mercantilists were telling people how many threads they could have in a, in a yard of woolen cloth and nonsense like that. Or in the colonial times, uh, the local town government would tell you when you could have a market day and when you couldn't have a market day. And, how heavy a loaf of bread had to be if you sold it at the public market. And so those kinds of things went back for centuries, and local governments inherited some of them 
when the English came and colonized North America, but they were very ill-enforced. And my old friend Jonathan Hughes wrote a book, wrote a book about colonial economic controls, and, uh, and he had gone through all the legal documents of the colonial period, and he had said, oh, look, it, this was a massive regulation in the colonial times. Uh, look at all the things they were controlling. What Jonathan didn't adequately take into account was the fact that hardly any of that was enforced. <laughs> because there wasn't anybody to enforce it. Who was gonna do it, the mayor? <laughs> Not bloody likely, if he wanted to be reelected. Uh, all the merchants would vote against him and probably almost all the people too. And <clears throat> nearly everybody lived out in the country or in a very small village, uh, well into the 19th century. So there wasn't anybody around to see what they were doing. They did what they wanted to do. Uh, you know, it's not that they committed murder freely. People would get up in arms about that. But, you know, if they wanted to sell a ha half-size loaf of bread, nobody was going to bother them for doing it, no matter what the legislation said in the state capitol or uh, in the, the records of the city government. Okay? So you had those kinds of things that were petering out in the 19th century. And then you had these states involved in a lot of improvements like canals, uh, a little bit of road building. Most of the roads were actually privately built, you know. Take note, all you critics of anarchists, most of the roads were privately built. <laughs> so that answers the question, who will build the roads? Uh, businessmen will build the roads, as they did then. They built hundreds of turnpikes in uh, the northeastern part of the country mainly. Uh, but anyhow, uh, state governments got involved a lot in canal building, somewhat in road building, some other public projects for transportation improvement like that. Later on, they invested in railroads. They invested in some places in banks. Uh, they, uh, you know, the U.S. Constitution for, forbade the, the states from issuing bills of credit. So the states just chartered banks that they owned and issued paper money. <laughs> That's how they made a loan to people. They, they, they established, you know, like the State Bank of Indiana, and then you went and borrowed, and what you got were pieces of paper that said, you know, $5 payable by the State Bank of Indiana. So they were issuing bills of credit. They just changed the form rather than the substance. Now, that kind of stuff, thank goodness, uh, was pretty much all smashed in the late 1930s, 1830s, and early 1840s. There was a pretty severe depression at that time, and one outcome of it was that all these state improvements, these canal companies and, and banks in particular, uh, went belly up. And when they did so, they left the taxpayers on the hook for a lot of bills, like for paying interest on all the securities these, these operations had issued. And so here, here the people, they're already in bad shape because there's been a depression and they're getting saddled with all these bad debts that public officials had run up, corruptly, I might add. I, I, I think you'd have trouble finding one of these operations that wasn't somehow corrupt. But uh, at all events, people were up in arms about that, so much so that they demanded revision of their state constitutions. And most of the state constitutions in the country were amended in the early 1940s with provisions that forbade the state from going into business for public improvements like canals and railroads and banks. Okay? And uh, for a long time, those provisions remained in force. So by the time we get into the 1840s and 50s, we got a pretty limited government at the local level, the state level, and of course the feds haven't done much of anything by that time to interfere with economic affairs. They, they collect tariffs, and that, you know, that is a tax on imported goods, and it has some effect in distorting uh, resource allocation in a domestic economy, but not, not a giant effect, particularly if the tariffs aren't real big which uh, they, they normally were not. So here, here we go. But that ideology that the government shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that, that's bad. Politicians are crooks. They can't be trusted. 
That began to wear thin in the late 19th century. New movements started to arise, some of them socialistic, some of them just homegrown progressivism, uh, <clears throat> all kinds of wacko theories and government programs. Uh, a lot of cr monetary crank ideas came forth. The Greenback Party was formed, and their idea was to create prosperity by voila. You know, the government should give everybody a lot of paper money. It says, that's why we're poor. We don't have money. <laughs> Anybody knows that, right? That's why you're poor. I'm poor. We don't have money. So if we just issue a lot of money, everything will be great. So at least the... Greenback Party thought so, uh, but they were just one of many, many crackpot, crank parties running around making proposals for having the government do extraordinary things in economic life. And gradually, this, this built up. The intellectuals began to turn tail. They began to be uh, uh, affected by socialism, particularly. Uh, you know, the, the intellectual class in the United States historically had been very tiny and it almost amounted to clergymen and a handful of oddballs like Thomas Jefferson, you know, John Adams, who were deep thinkers. And, uh, uh, but in the late 19th century, the number of college professors and lawyers and judges and people who sort of verge on being intellectuals be became much larger. And they were reading around, and of course, Americans, American intellectuals tended to, to be very diffident relative to their British counterparts and, and their German counterparts, you know, these learned men of Europe. Uh, the Germans had been giving PhD degrees for ages in their universities. And so when the Americans decided they needed more intellectuals, and they started changing the nature of their higher education institutions to to, to bring that end uh, to attainment, they, they, they started going to Europe to educate themselves. And a lot of Americans went to Germany in particular to study for their PhD degrees. You know, they could get one of those colorful robes from Heidelberg and they could come back and prance around at graduation ceremonies like <laughs> they were the high priests of knowledge. And uh, some of these people were highly influential in shaping the nature of American academic and intellectual life generally. Now at that time the Germans had sort of independently uh, reinvented the wheel of socialism uh, and uh, they did it in a strange way in service of a very conservative Juncker government in Germany that was afraid of a growing socialist movement among the workers. And so uh, the Iron Chancellor, Bismarck, got it in his head very cleverly, no dummy he, uh, he, he got it in his head that we can buy off these revolutionary workers if we promise to take care of them in their <clears throat> greatest needs. If, if they get sick and can't work, if they're hurt on the job, if they get old and they haven't saved enough money to support themselves in their old age, we can give them uh, health care, we can give them unemployment insurance, we can give them old age pensions, we can give them, that is, the welfare state. Okay? It was really invented by Bismarck in late 19th century Germany in order to divert the radicalism of the German socialist labor movement. And it worked. The movement kept growing, but the the attachment the workers had to it was not very deep. And the way we know that is that uh, one of the central tenets of the socialist movement was that, that uh, the workers of the world are all brothers. Okay? And they only would fight one another because they're being tricked by the, <clears throat> the, the state, the various nation states that send them out to war. But they, they, learned that, uh, they learned that it's not our fight, you know. If one, one country's royalty wants to go take land away from the next country's royalty, that's just tough. We socialists won't go out there and die for that nonsense until 1914, that is. When the German socialists just put on their uniforms and trooped out to the trenches to die by the millions, so, 
it worked for Bismarck, <laughs> but, it, but uh, this, was, this was a very strange development. The Americans brought back German ideas about the welfare state, and they began to influence the dominant ideology. They, along with a lot of other people. Uh, progressivism is uh, a, a movement and a mode of thinking with many sources. Again, it's very difficult to summarize it. But by all events, in the early 20th century, it had become a thing to be reckoned with. Right? It has started to influence people. It certainly was having a substantial influence on opinion makers. And so you had like all the boys that went to Harvard, you know, the best East Coast schools. They were being taught this kind of stuff. My own university up, up, up uh, the road here, Johns Hopkins, was the first university in America that gave PhD degrees. It was established in 1876. And it was established by people who were just building a model of the German universities. And it was meant to be a place where people did research. They didn't just train clergymen and, you know, rich people's sons. That's what colleges had done before, mostly. Uh, so you got these changes in ideology that began to come into their own with progressivism. And progressivism was among many other things, the idea that government can and should intervene widely in economic and social affairs. It should be, as it were, the savior of first resort, not last, you know. People had always gone to government as a last resort if they were up against the wall and dying, you know. They'd go anywhere to save themselves then, but, but under the old ideological conditions, that was not how people acted, behaved, or believed. But with progressivism coming into sway, people began to view the government as their protector, their savior of first resort. And that way of thinking has persisted right up to the present day. In fact, it got stronger as a result of the later national crises, especially the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, so it's still one of the conditions in play today. Now. If you have a, a national crisis of some kind, whether it's a war, a big business depression, whatever it is, why does that stage two, that expansion phase of the ratchet occur? I think there are two main types of, of uh, things happening. One, one is fear. Okay. Every national emergency, almost by definition, makes people afraid of something. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an emergency. It would just be another damn item in the e course of events, right? It's an emergency, though, something to be afraid of. If it's a business depression, you're afraid you're going to lose your job, lose your income, lose your home, lose your business, lose your farm, okay? Things are about to be lost. You're afraid. You're going to lose things that are of value to you, maybe even your, your life, you know, if you can't feed yourself and your family anymore. So fear is pervasive at the onset of a national crisis. And in a condition of progressivism as the dominant ideology, that fear leads immediately to the demand that the government do something to allay the crisis. Right? Now, that hadn't always been the case. When, when say, the, the Depression of 1873 started, there was no giant upsurge across the country of demand that the national government jump in and save the day. Uh, and even as late as the mid-1890s, with the second worst depression in American history, there were more people then calling on the Cleveland administration to help the farmers. Farm prices had collapsed, to help the industrial workers. Unemployment among industrial workers had reached probably 20 percent. We don't have precise measurements, but that's in the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, lots of calls were being made, even in the mid-1890s, for the national government to save the day. And Cleveland and his cabinet members just basically said, it's not our job. The Constitution does not empower us to involve ourselves in in, in remedying economic depressions. Uh, so we're going to do only what it takes to preserve 
order. We're going to preserve the gold standard. We're going to stay out of agricultural intervention. We're going to stay out of make work projects. We're going to stay out of all kinds of things. We're going to keep the government limited because we're only going to do what we think the Constitution empowers this government to do. And uh, it's instructive to, to note, one, that they did that, and second, that they paid a heavy political price for doing it. Okay? By doing what had been done by Jeffersonian Democrats for a century, conditions had changed enough to expose the Cleveland administration to great negative feedback from the public. And so Cleveland was the last of the Jeffersonian Democrats. And the nature of the Democratic Party changed. And in, in, in 96, of course, the candidate was, was Brian, who was a Democrat, but kind of also endorsed by the Populist Party, which was a real Looney Tunes outfit. Uh, but they, they adopted him as their candidate, too, which tells you something. And he was highly inflationist. He wanted to change federal government monetary policy to our gold and silver in a way that would have resulted in high rates of price inflation throughout the economy if those programs had been adopted. But uh, Brian lost, of course, to McKinley. And then in 1900, an official gold standard act was passed to, to make it official that the government doesn't just maintain the gold standard as a convention, but by law. And then that remained in effect with some temporary changes during World War I, but basically until it was abandoned in 1933. So, so you've now got fear and a widespread demand that the government, and even the federal government, do something. Uh, and on top of that, you've got a, a flood of opportunists. You've got opportunists both inside the government and outside it. And uh, these people are demanding that the government do something because, you know, if you're a government bureaucrat or a politician, that may be a way to promote your power and uh, uh, feather your nest and keep you in office a long time, win you friends with people capable of giving bribes to you. Uh, a lot of good could come to you by jumping into the mess with some new government bailout program. And of course, the private sector opportunists just trying to turn a bad situation into a good one for them. Maybe, maybe they get their failing firm bailed out. Maybe they get an opportunity to go into business that wouldn't have been there but for some new government program. Okay? Government buys a lot of stuff when it sets out to do anything substantive, so somebody's selling that to the government. You could be a government contractor and get rich. That always happened during wartime, by the way. It was a, just a constant going back to the colonial times and, and is a constant today. Okay? This damn city here is encircled by these vultures who come here only for one reason, and that is to make money off of the taxpayers under the pretext of somehow protecting you and me. So. It's an old uh, type of opportunism, and it's one that can help produce a surge of uh, government size, scope, and power uh, during that second stage. Pre-crisis normality, that's stage one. Growth, that's stage two. Crisis, that's stage three. Retrenchment, partial, stage four. Post-crisis normality, that's stage five. That's what happens during stage two. Fear, do something, opportunism, and uh, government expands very rapidly. Now, government has a lot of ways to expand. Uh, I mentioned earlier that just focusing on fiscal measures, like the amount of spending, taxing, borrowing, uh, that's not enough because there are ways in which government can grow without growing in those dimensions. It can, for example, just pass a law that says you've got to do something and pay the bill. <laughs> and in fact, that's become increasingly popular over time to do it that way, you see. Uh, suppose Obamacare involved setting up a new Obama insurance company, right? And they had to, you know, finance their company and raise capital for it and uh, hire all the people that run the operation and provide the services and 
so forth. They didn't do that. They just said, we're going to fine you if you don't go out and do business with an insurance company. So you bear the cost. It doesn't show up as any big growth of government's fiscal size, but it's an enormous change in government's power because government has hardly ever told people they just have to buy a particular good or service with their own money or be penalized for it. So that's a huge increase in the power of government that hardly makes a ripple. Uh, the IRS is the enforcement agency, and it's already there. Okay? So you have to do very little to bulk up the IRS to enforce this new system. So we need to look at how government grows uh, not just in fiscal ways, but in power ways, through laws, through regulations. Uh, and we need to look also at what I call the unofficial uh, element of the government. That is, people who appear to be private agents, firms, individuals, but they are private in name only. Okay? Say, is Lockheed Martin part of the government? Yes. Okay? It's true it has private owners, investors, and you know you can buy its shares on the New York Stock Exchange and it pays out dividends to owners and you know does all the rest of what a normal private firm would do. But Lockheed Martin gets all of its money from selling stuff to the government, practically all of it to the Pentagon. Okay? The government could do the same thing in-house. Let's say it nationalized Lockheed Martin and it made it a part of the Department of Defense. See, the government has some arsenals, some shipyards, right? So they can produce munitions, they can produce weapons. They've done it from the very beginning. But instead of doing that, they contract with private parties, firms, that, that appear to be private but wouldn't even exist but for the fact that taxpayer money is being channeled to them and contracts being entered into by government officials who tell them exactly what they want and how they want it done and so forth. Now, of course, the Lockheed people have tremendous influence before the government tells them what they want. In fact, they go in there and tell the government what it's going to tell them to want. But uh, that, that just says it's politicking inside the government. There's always that going on. But anyhow, you have to be careful about that. There's a man named Ivan Light who studied government employment, for example, for a long time. And what he found, for example, is that uh, as of the early years of, of the 21st century, the federal government appeared to have about 2 million people on its payroll. Well, that seems like very few, you know, in a giant 150 million people labor force. Uh, but he also found that if you make reasonable uh, inclusions of people who are living off government grants and contracts, then to that 2 million uh, federal employees, you can add approximately 15 million other persons, which no longer is a little deal, right? You go from 2 million people sucking off the federal tit to 17 million, just like that. So, you know, we should not be deceived by appearances, uh, accounting conventions, and other kind of trickery like that. Uh, that's one of the ways in which the predators operate, is by making things seem to be what they are not really. Now, every crisis ends. I mean, that, that's almost part of the definition of a crisis. If something were permanent, we couldn't really call it a crisis, right? We'd have to call it just the nature of things. Uh, but every real crisis ends, uh, every national emergency ends, or at least they used to. Of course, the war on terror, that will never end. Okay? So that's the beauty of it. It's the never-ending crisis. It's dealt with as if it were a crisis, but it never ends. <laughs> wow! They found, the, they, they found the secret of the key to heaven. Uh, so in a normal crisis, there's an end, you know? When the, when the Japanese come out with their, you know, white flag, you can say <laughs> World War II is over, you know? They're, it's true, there's still, they're still, you know, Yamaguchi's hiding in the jungle in New Guinea somewhere, but, 
let's forget about him. The war is over. Everybody knows it's over. So even if you're a federal official and you want to just keep plowing ahead, you know, like you're the Boeing company and you want to keep selling 800 B-29s every year, no matter what, uh, the way you did in 1945, it's pretty hard to make that fly. You know? <laughs> Too many people are going to say, that's rotten, you know. Doesn't mean it won't happen, you know, right? I was just reading recently about one of the tank companies that Pentagon doesn't even want tanks anymore. They got other toys to play with. They don't want tanks, but the tank makers want to keep selling them, and congressmen want to make the Pentagon keep buying them. So they're going to, you know, probably end up buying the damn tanks and parking them somewhere and letting them gather dust. So that can happen, but if you've, if you've, run a deal like World War II where over 40% of the measured GDP is for war purposes, uh, you can't fake everybody forever into saying, we've got to keep doing exactly the same things. So the crisis ends, and when the crisis ends, the government has to retrench in various ways, but it retrenches uh, uh, against resistance almost every step of the way. And the reason is that there, there are, first of all, vested interests. Okay? Those, those aircraft companies uh, in World War II that had just made buku bucks okay, had been almost garage operations before World War II. The aircraft manufacturing industry was a very small scale deal before the war. During the war, owing in large part to the government making investments in plant and equipment that those aircraft companies then operated as contractors, uh, as well as subsidizing them in other ways, uh, those companies have become giant. They were some of the biggest companies in America, and they were making huge amounts of money in uh, 1943, 4, 5. Okay? So are they going to just fold their arms and say, oh, well, the, world, the war is over? No, that's not what they did. They jumped in there and started being kind of... Uh, uh, geostrategists explaining to all their pals in the Pentagon that, you know, the Russians are a terrible menace and we got to be ready. If we can't intimidate them or even defeat them in a shooting war, our goose is cooked. So they became uh, incessant lobbyists and very good ones, very well organized, well financed ones. They've been doing this ever since. World War II ended, and it's still working pretty well for a lot of them to this day. So you've got vested interests that are built up during a crisis. They don't want to retrench, okay? and that's inside the government too, not just outside among the contractors and grant recipients. And when people try to resist the retrenchment, uh, they have an important advantage over the rest of us. That is, they control a lot of the information that's relevant to making a decision about whether the government should back down or not. Uh, who are you going to ask about the importance of maintaining a, a readiness industrial capacity among aircraft makers? Well, who knows about that better than the aircraft makers and the people in the Air Force? So they'll be the people that go and testify before congressional committees that decide on what to do about ordering aircraft. Uh, and in fact, the insiders are almost always the ones that testify at, at, at congressional uh, hearings involving any kind of spending. It's always the people who are going to be the recipients of the money. There have been some formal studies of this. Uh, 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 Jim Payne, a friend of mine out in Idaho, has done some great work to show that that the, the people who testify in these hearings, you know, they're like way over 90% in favor of spending more money, always. And they're the only kind. It's very hard to really be heard if you take the opposing view. So control of information is important because then, of course, the press gets its information from things like c congressional hearings, and, and they spread this to the general public. And finally, there is, particularly inside the government, there, there's mission creep and, and also what I would call mission jump. Is that at the end of a war, a lot of these wartime agencies decided that they didn't want to fold up their tent. They just wanted to kind of change what they do. And that happened after both World Wars, more, more so after World War II than after the first war. 
But if you look, say, in World War I, the government created the, the, the War Finance Corporation. And this was a way of uh, getting the money the government had accumulated and, uh, through borrowing or, or taxing and then doling it out to certain companies that were making essential materials for the war. Uh, well, when the war ends, what happens to the War Finance Committee? Well, it keeps going, but it no longer has any contractors to bankroll. Now it, it, it bankrolls exporters because the Europeans who, who want to buy these exports have no money. You know, Europe is blown to hell, and millions of Europeans are dead, and lots of others are sick and dying. Uh, so that's a bad market, uh, but still the exporters want to sell. So what basically happens is the War Finance Committee pays for those exports by lending to the people who, who appear on the, uh, the bill of sale to be the buyers. And uh, uh, then they, a few years later, the War Finance Committee started lending money to agricultural co-ops and rural banks to prop up uh, the prosperity of farmers. And that had nothing to do with financing World War I, of course. It was just politic. And so this happens again and again, uh, that some agency created during an emergency to do one thing resists uh, elimination or retrenchment by moving its mission over into some new area. So you got this mission jump and mission creep going on as well. And finally, you've got something I think is uh, tremendously important as a result of this whole episode, and that is that uh, people learn from doing, learn from experience, and, and that applies also, they learn from being beaten. Okay? If I come and whip you every day, after a while you'll get used to it. <laughs> you may not like it, but pretty soon it won't seem so extraordinary as it did the first time. Oh, time for my whooping, you know? <laughs> It's that time of day. Well, you see, if you'd been trying to tell people in 1939 uh, how much they could charge for ordinary goods and services or, you know, what kinds of contracts they could and couldn't make, they would have thought that was overbearing beyond toleration. But if you've done that for three, four years during World War II, they've even adjusted how they do business to the fact that government agents tell them precisely that kind of stuff. And people come around and actually will, will punish them legally if they find they're charging more than the ceiling price for their goods and, or if they're, if they're selling to people they weren't authorized to sell to by the, by the priority people issuing in the War Production Board or whatever it is. People were ordered around during the command economy of World War II so heavily for so long that they, as it were, their will to be free men and women was, if not broken, it was certainly beaten down. And on top of that, they were told, and it seemed like a plausible story, that all the nonsense that had been done during the war, that they didn't particularly like when it was done to them, was part of winning the war. And by God, look, we won the war, right? They've given up. We, we beat them all. And we beat them all. Why? Because we war managers really ran a clever war economy. But for us, who knows what disaster would have befallen us. Huh? Post hoc ergo propter hoc. We did all this crap. We won the war. Therefore, this crap is good. Okay? <laughs> that was the logic of the thing. That was, in fact, the ideological lesson that if only at an unconscious level, a great many people carried away from both world wars. And in some cases, the war managers undertook to spread that kind of propaganda. After World War I, Bernard Baruch, who was a very wealthy investor and, and, and a leading angel for democratic politicians at that time, uh, hired a bunch of people to write books and then gave them to every public library in America, books showing that Bernard Baruch, the economic czar, as he was known, uh, had managed World War I economic control so astutely that the United States won the war, you know, notwithstanding that the U.S. contribution to winning the war was really quite minor compared to what the French and the British and others had, had done, but especially in terms of lives lost, it was almost 
rounding error compared to, to the French and British loss of life, and certainly the Russian, you know, they lost more than everybody else put together. So here we come along, we say, we won the war, we did it because the government knows how to do big things. Just, you know, you just got to stand by and allow government to use its powers to the full. And furthermore, obviously, if it can do something as big as, as winning world wars, obviously it can do things like provide decent housing for people, provide good jobs for the unemployed and the underemployed. It can, it can provide all kinds of services for people who are suffering or at risk of suffering in a multitude of ways. Certainly, if we can win a world war, we, the government can run a decent welfare state. That was the lesson. That was an ideological legacy of these world wars. And so uh, we're, we're dealing with that legacy even now. Okay, now let's take up the question I warned you we'd come to. Uh, is this going to just keep going on forever? If it, if it is, then the government is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in one way or another. Maybe it'll be disguised. Maybe it'll be made to look like it's private when it's not really, you know, like, like you're buying that insurance policy you wouldn't have bought, all you young people, okay? Uh, maybe it'll look like that, but whether it looks like something that's on a government uh, budget or whether it's on your budget, whether it's just orders that the cop on the street gives you that he has no absolute right to give you whatsoever, whether it's anything whatsoever, government is going to keep getting bigger. Every crisis is going to ratchet it up to a higher level. Okay? Well, what can stop it? I think there are two main ways that it can be brought to a halt. Uh, one of them is probably in the very distant future, and that is that the whole system can just break down under its own weight. Uh, Mises explained long ago that all the internal inconsistencies that are intrinsic to government planning without use of the price system just cannot be avoided. You, you, you can't allocate resources in a, in a truly economic fashion without private property and a working price system. There have been mul multiple attempts by economists and others to, to monkey with mechanisms that they thought would mimic the price system and allow it to be set aside and get rid of private property, but, but they don't work, okay? Can't be done. So the more power government has to allocate resources and to tell people what to do and what not to do, the more irrational the whole system's gonna be. That is, it ultimately becomes uh, an engine of uh, uh, immiseration. And you see that, of course, in places where central planning was attempted in the 20th century, in the Soviet Union and uh, China and uh, other places. You know, that was just a, a, t a, a ticket to economic nowhere or worse. Uh, so that's one way that the, this uh, perpetual upward ratcheting can be halted. Uh, but, but there's another way. That is, you know, remember, it's got, a, it's got an essential ideological precondition, which is a progressivism as the dominant ideology. If people in large numbers suddenly lost their belief in the idea that government can and should undertake all these activities and exercise all these powers, then the system could not survive for long because all it's got then is raw force. And raw force just, you know, it's a very clumsy, poor uh, tool for maintaining control of a society. People learned thousands of years ago that if you rely on raw force alone, that's not going to work for long. For one thing, it makes everybody angry. And so pretty soon, they're getting so desperate that they rise up against you. Right? And they're willing to die, in, in some cases, to get rid of your power. So the rulers knew long ago that you need to combine the power of the throne with the power of the altar. Okay. And so for millennia, religion, the, the, the priesthood, was brought into an iron alliance with the warriors who ruled every society. And the priest told people that either the ruler is himself a god, or he's certainly blessed by the gods, 
or somehow he's the, he's the guy who, who, who ought to be there by right. And so people were taught this their whole life. And when they started thinking about rising them up against the ruler, their, their mind would give them pause. They would say, well, wait a minute. Can, you know, what'll happen if I kill God? What'll, what'll happen if I kill someone blessed by God, put in place by God himself? <clears throat> uh, you know, the, they weren't all the beneficiaries of GMU education. They didn't have always the kind of inquiring minds that you all have. So they're just peasants. So they could be kept in place to a large extent by the right kind of priesthood and the right kind of priestly doctrines. Now, the priesthood as such eventually uh, became less important as societies became more secular in the last several centuries. But the, but the beauty of the thing for government is that as the priesthood per se declined in influence and power, an alternative priesthood arose. Uh, the ideologists, okay? the secular priesthood, the people who justify what government does, you know, who invent theories of market failure, uh, who, who tell us why only government can accomplish great and noble and glorious things, uh, people that now exist by the millions, almost all of them on the public payroll in one way or another, usually at public universities, and so they're educating all the young people uh, with doctrines that justify government and its vast powers and its vast uh, resource allocation measures of all kinds. So, so we've, got, we've still got this priesthood, and that's going to make it very hard to have an ideological revolution. But if we don't have one, then all we can do is wait for the day, whether it's 10 years or 50 years or 100 years down the road, when the system collapses of its own internal contradictions. Okay. So that's how I see the future. Uh, I, I think ideological change in current day circumstances is a very, very hard job to pull off. Now, obviously, there are people working at it. Uh, all the people that were down at that conference where I was on Saturday, they're, they're trying to do something and move in that direction to change the dominant ideology. I wish them Godspeed, but they got their work cut out for them because at the same time that we're having our wonderful conference and we've got 1,800 young people there, every day down to D.C., you know, clogging the freeway, go hundreds of thousands of highly paid people who have access to public officials, who have connections, who have money, who have the power to pay de facto bribes to public officials. Right? That's what you're up against. And those people aren't interested in an ideological revolution. On the contrary, they're working very hard to see that that ideological revolution doesn't occur. Right? I was telling the crowd on Saturday that, that to, between 1999 and 2006, the number of firms that were providing uh, goods and services to the government for, in connection with Homeland Security increased from nine firms, okay, in 1999, nine firms. In 2006, there were more than 33,000. Uh, Jim Bennett wrote a nice book about what a scam all this is. Because, you know, to make a long story short, there is no terrorist threat. It's, at most, it's rounding error, okay? And they've leveraged knocking down those two big buildings in New York to, to, to run all this stuff past the American public and make them pay the bill for it. And meanwhile, these hundreds, thousands uh, of predators, opportunists, have rushed into the breach to make a lot of loot off of this non-existent terrorist threat. And they're spreading the word, you know, look under your bed, could be a terrorist there right now. Uh, see something, say something. Uh, you know, keep your line open to the FBI. Don't have to worry about telling NSA, they already know. Okay? <laughs> So uh, they're keeping us all on edge to the extent they can 
because it's very important that they do so if they're going to keep raking in the loot. That comes from us. All comes from us, the ordinary chickens here. Yeah. Well, I think that gives you a general idea of the notion of the logic of crisis and, and Leviathan, and there's a lot more to learn. So as I say, you know, please do buy a dozen of each of these books. <laughs> Hello. Um, would you say that the common denominator for progressive, progressive, sorry, <laughs> uh, that allows to, for the bankroll of, of um, all these programs would be central banking in all these countries that adopted this ide ideology? No, I wouldn't. I don't think that's a necessary condition. It, it's certainly been used in that way, uh, so it's a, it's a sufficient condition, and it's a big big part of how government has gone through all the great crises since World War I, including the present one, of course, when it's, the Fed has just done extraordinary things. I mean, if you'd, if you'd told me eight years ago what the Fed was going to do, I would have said, you're nuts. You know, there's zero probability of that being done. Okay? And, you know, I'm a really smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have been totally wrong, right? I don't know of anybody who ever dreamed of injecting over $2 trillion in excess reserves into the banking system. You know, they started out with one or two billion. One or two billion was what excess reserves were before 2007, and now they're well over two trillion. Uh, so now, now the whole economy's in a real trap because <laughs> they can't stay there forever. It's not a permanently sustainable situation. And so then the question is, how are things going to play out when they, then they try to wriggle out? You know, everybody's, all the Fed watchers have been guessing for years, when are they going to back, back down? When are they going to stop the quantitative easing? When are they going to stop <clears throat> buying all the securities that Fannie and Freddie issue and issued in the past and you know like the, the government has now taken over the home financing of America over 90 percent of the mortgage money comes straight from government controlled institutions so a whole industry was gobbled up there and hardly anybody even described it in that way they just thought it was a bailout for Fannie and Freddie a bailout yeah bailout cum takeover was what it was. So uh, uh, how they're going to get out of this is anybody's guess, I think. You, you, can re you can read what Ben Bernanke wrote. He's written, you know, how, how he thinks he's going to uh, exit from this extraordinary situation. Uh, I myself can't see that it will work. I, I pray to God it will, actually because all the things I think will happen instead of its working are very bad. And uh, I'd rather it worked. Okay. Thank you. What thing, like a short, a short, what do you think will happen if it, the exit doesn't work? <laughs> I know, I realize this is going to be a whole nother, would be a whole nother lecture, but yeah. a short, maybe? I, I, I really don't know, you know, it would be a wild guess. I think what will happen when, when interest rates, not just short term, but long term interest rates, sort of the whole um, term structure of rates starts to, to rise substantially, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, first of all, put a tremendous pressure on the Treasury to finance its debt issuance. Uh, the, the Fed has been doing something in the last several years that it never did before except to a small extent during World War II, and that is it's just outright uh, buying tre Treasury bonds. And, you know, instead of going into open market and doing open market operations the way it historically did, which would accommodate the government as 
the purchases trickle through the banking system. Uh, now it's just going straight and giving them an account. You know, here you got a bond, we'll take that. Here's a here's another fifty billion dollars, and they go spend it. Okay, so that kind of stuff that's like Zimbabwe economics, and that doesn't work forever. Uh, so what's going to happen if they stop it, or even if they cut back on it, I think, is that the government's going to have very serious uh, difficulties financing its debt. It's going to have to pay much higher interest rates. See, one of the reasons the government has been able to hold up running up such huge amounts of additional public debt in the last uh, 12 years or so is that the interest rates are so low. You know, the, the service cost of, of all that new debt is not huge, you know. Even at the interest rates of 2006, it would have been several times greater than it is. So they've, you know, they've pu they pushed the term structure down to the short end, <laughs> and they've got the Fed to buy all the junk, and, and now they're just praying that the foreign holders of the outstanding debt don't all at once uh, decide to, to stampede and sell this stuff. I, I, I don't think they will, by the way, because that would be self-defeating. Uh, the Chinese and the Japanese uh, hold the big chunks, and uh, they're just going to hurt themselves if they start selling it off very rapidly because they're going to incur big capital losses. But who knows? If they're nervous enough, if they're nervous enough about what's going to happen to the dollar down the road, they could try to unload that while the unloading is good. I just have no idea. I do know that, you know, the Chinese are actively communicating with the Treasury all the time, telling them, you guys got to get your ship in order here, you know. You got to reduce these deficits. You can't keep running up this debt. We're not going to buy more of it. The Chinese haven't added to their holdings for several years, and... So where's it going to go? Well, where it's gone is to the Fed is where it's gone. But, you know, you can't run Zimbabwe here. This is not Zimbabwe. Uh, we can't live like that here. We'll all starve to death. You know, some of the Zimbabweans did too, of course. But, but people won't tolerate the, that, that kind of horrible play out here. And they would just insist on some kind of government takeovers, nationalizations, you know. You name it, whatever it takes to, to rebuild a command economy that can put bread on the table and uh, at least keep people from starving. So I don't know. There's never, there's never been a situation like this before. That's the reason I, I don't even pretend I know how it's going to play out. It's, it's just completely new. It's without precedent. Uh, I just myself can't convince myself of any of the pleasant scenarios working. Okay, there's a hand up here. When you were doing your research over the past century, um, which did you find was more elastic? And was there a change in the elasticity between um, the shrinking of the government sector and then the contracts, which, or the contractors, which um, were not technically in the government, but worked mm -hmm. for the government? And was there a change in the elasticity um, of those when they would shrink back down after the crises? Um, as it's gotten closer and closer to the present? Uh, I think the retrenchment was in the both world wars. It was greater uh, uh, among the outside contractors than it was for the government itself, if you don't count the armed forces. If you count the armed forces, then, you know, there's, uh, after World War I, there's almost total demobilization. And after World War II, the armed forces shrink from, from, uh, 12 million people in uniform to, to one and a half million in a two-year to three-year period. So, but if you look at the civilian employees, there's much less shrinkage. They did just cancel a lot of contracts in both World War I and World War II. As soon as the armistice occurred in 1918, they started canceling war contracts. In fact, a lot of those cancellations were in the courts for years and years and years. Uh, being thrashed out, and after World War II, they 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 started canceling contracts too. Those were settled more expeditiously. Uh, uh, World War II was, you know, granted that it's a command economy and it's just 
pervaded by screw-ups of all kinds. Nonetheless, it was handled better than World War I. Uh, and they did some things pretty astutely at the end because a lot of people wanted to keep the government, for example, actively involved in maintaining comprehensive price controls. And thank God uh, the people who opposed that prevailed. And so they very quickly uh, uh, dropped almost all the price controls, all the direct materials allocations and things that had been used during the war. They, they reimposed the price controls for a while in 1946, but when, when they did that, the farmers wouldn't bring any beef to market, and so everybody went crazy. <laughs> There's no beef in the meat markets, and, uh, and the Truman administration reversed itself. And by the end of 1946, uh, virtually every price control was, was gone. That was, a, that was a huge measure of, of return to a normal economy because a price-controlled economy is, is, is really a doomed thing. You know, <laughs> pretending to displace the price system across the board is a recipe not just for disaster but for quick disaster. And they could do it during the war for a short time, only because more people would accept it given the rationale that it was for war. But they could never do it that like that in peacetime. And thank goodness they didn't try. But a lot of those, uh, those programs did, as I say, they migrated to new uses, the missions. Uh, they, uh, they, they were moved around inside the government and kept in some form or other but uh, the contractors were mostly cut loose. They came back pretty fast, uh, and then particularly when the Korean War broke out in 1950, then they were back in business. And from that time on, the Cold War kept, kept them in business for the most part. So um, e events uh, intervened in their favor in, in, a, in a way, not, not the, the, that course of events was wholly independent of the actions of the contractors either. They were big exponents of fighting the Cold War and running the arms race. Uh, and uh, as, as a result, be, be, between 1948 and uh, 1989, when the uh, Soviet Union basically folded up, uh, in that period, uh, the whole period, about 7.5, no, 7.6 percent of GDP was paid for defense purchases, uh, and a lion's share of the technical, engineering, and scientific employment in the country was for war purposes, which entailed a huge opportunity cost for productivity increase in civilian production. So. These, uh, these, the, the, these people came back pretty quickly, even though they had shrunk drastically in 1946, 47. Okay, thanks a lot for coming.